Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim, and today we'll talk about libraries with special guests, Tracy Hall, Executive Director of the American Library Association, David Leonard, President of the Boston Public Library, and Bridget Quinn, President and CEO of the Hartford Public Library. So it's great to have you all here, and thank you so much for coming and sharing the the world of libraries with us. Um, so just to sort of set you up, Tracy, I'm going to go to you. Um, there's, libraries have such a fundamental role in uh, American civil society. They're gateways to knowledge and culture, provide us all with equal access to information and services. And they used to be more book warehouses. They've evolved considerably. So let's talk about how you have seen in your uh, arc in your lifetime, libraries evolve, Tracy, and how libraries are basically confronting the COVID situation and changes in American civil society. Yes, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm uh, so excited to be here and to join in this conversation and 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 to also be in conversation with uh, Bridget and David. Um, so. Um, I would say that at the time I became a librarian, um, and at the time I started to work in libraries, um, which uh, was in um, the early 90s, libraries were moving away from that sort of book warehouse type of uh, approach and moving away from circulation being the main indicator of, of use or impact and moving towards um, I think a more immersive approach to things such as educational programming and adult and early education. So I started my career at the Seattle Public Library. And at that time, Seattle was actually moving from um, being really widely known because of the fishing industry, et cetera, um, the aerospace industry as being uh, known for uh, industry, uh, for, um, for fishing and, and those types of things um, and moving um, from more blue collar work to more white collar work because of the rise of Amazon and Adobe and of course, Microsoft and, and many others. And so what we saw and what we participated in, even in the early stages of, um, of, of the internet then um, was really a mass education um, of adults and, and, and mass introduction of adults uh, to computing, to personal computing and to personal technology. And also the preparation that was largely happening in libraries of reskilling uh, those workers so that they could work um, in, in digital industries um, or, or could work. Um, and I think we're seeing that now, and we'll talk about that later as we move to more of a hybrid or um, even remote workforce that we are now also, um, libraries will be engaged in that reskilling. So I think that um, in the arc of my career, what I have seen ultimately is the rise and the primacy of libraries um, in adult education, as a main provider of, of uh, adult education, lifelong learning, early uh, literacy, um, education um, for um, uh, and support for new immigrants, um, and um, and and also to supporting um, those who may not have completed high school um, in in supporting uh, in in completing high school. So it has been just a, a mass, I think, mobilization um, on the library front, and and that's in public libraries. But I think we've seen parallel tracks in academic and in um, K through 12 libraries as well. You know, it's it's interesting how the arc of history bends, right? If you go back to Andrew Carnegie and his really huge investment as an industrialist, right? Uh, in, in the steel business, huge investment in libraries internationally and famously built so many libraries across the United States, David. What, what Tracy is talking about is really a, a redefinition, but a redefinition of libraries from a book warehouse to a civil society, uh, to, into civil society service uh, institutions that really harkens back to, to those days, right? Yeah, and even even before, uh, thanks, thanks, Mark. And I think Tracy is exactly right. In the case of Boston, if we go back to 1848 and look at the spirit of, you know, our own charter captured in the phrase free to all, it may mean something slightly different in the 21st century than it did in the 19th century, but it's it's effectively still about 
democratizing access to information and resources. And, you know, I think although we're, you know, 20 to 30 years into this digital revolution, which is really the marker that um, we enter the 21st century with, um, that plus this redefinition of libraries as more of a community hub and community resource center um, really allows us to capitalize on, on that spirit in a new way. And I think that, you know, we've had a very difficult year, year and a half, like every other sector, like every other part of society in the globe. But coming through COVID, you know, we're absolutely perfectly positioned to help with two great challenges ahead. That of youth engagement, so much learning loss has occurred, so much social and emotional learning loss has occurred. And libraries will again be a trusted space where kids of all ages can uh, come back and re reconnect with their, with their learning goals. And secondly, um, workforce development is a key area where uh, we can play a role in helping with the economic recovery and to do so in an equitable manner so that we can actually be better than where we came from from before COVID. That's, that's the hope. And that's, that's, I think, as relevant today as it was, whether it's the Carnegie era or even before Carnegie. Well, Benjamin Franklin with his Junto Club, right, which was the first uh, really book sharing service founded by a publisher. And then later on, the deeding uh, of uh, Thomas Jefferson's uh, library to uh, found the, the, the Library of Congress. Uh, Bridget, Hartford is, is such an interesting case study because it is such a renowned center of manufacturing uh, um, uh, in terms of the Industrial Revolution, then became an insurance hub. Uh, now is going through um, a, another transformation. Talk a little bit about the Hartford Public Library's history, because it's just fascinating, and 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 how you are moving into the future. Absolutely. Well, thanks, Mark, and I'm I'm thrilled to be here with my my two esteemed colleagues. Um, Hartford has a, a fascinating history, and our our library dates back um, over 200 years. We were part of the Athenaeum, and we started as a um, as a service that was with the museum and with the historical society. And what's really interesting is that even though we've, we've um, grown and, and spread into our own institutions, there's still this wonderful connection between all of the organizations in the city. Um, and you're right. I mean, for so many years, Hartford's been considered, you know, the, the insurance capital of the world. Um, but we are moving into other industries, but it's a lot of technology. You know, there's financial tech, there's insurance tech. You know, we have, um, we still have aerospace in our, in our backyard. So um, those are industries that have a high demand for our skilled workforce. And we are certainly, um, you know, attuned to that and want to make sure that there's opportunities for people. I mean, we have a whole city full of people that I think are incredibly ambitious and we want them to know what their opportunities are. And I, I, I kind of think of us sometimes as you know, the first mile and, and the last mile is introducing young people to options for uh, careers that they may not have thought about or that they may not have realized what the path looks like. So that's a huge push for our um, youth services is just making sure young people know what all their options are. But I just want to harken back a little bit to what both you know Tracy and, and David were talking about because I know this is something that that is near and dear to Tracy is you know what I think we've learned through COVID um, well not we we as librarians have known this for a really really long time um, but I was just on a, another discussion panel the other day that says wow COVID has really shown that there's a huge digital divide for students <laughs> it was oh, yeah. like really like we've been screaming this from the rooftops for decades that there's a digital divide. And sadly in Hartford, there's still about 30 to 40% of households that don't have broadband at home. And then when you pile on top, all of a sudden, maybe two, three kids that are trying to learn from home and parents that are trying to work from home, it just doesn't work. So, you know, I think our cities and Hartford in particular, I'm really proud of their response, the school district and the city. Um, but it ends up, you know, just highlighting the challenge there. And the libraries, again, have shown their value as kind of this public help desk. Because as much as the schools can do to hand out devices and laptops, um, and we provide content, they provide content, there's still a lot of questions. So I think that's still a really important thing that we as a, as a library field and as communities, we still haven't solved and we need to. 
Yeah, I think that, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead, David. Um, I just think that COVID has proven how vital libraries are. You know, throughout the country, um, different places were able to stay open or go into lockdown or move back and forth at different paces, depending on, you know, local challenges. Uh, but in our case, we saw more people sign up for library cards than ever in a typical year during this time. Um, we, we lent more books than we had, like we're talking about, we're no longer the place of warehouse of books anymore. We still lent more books in the last 12 months than we have done in any year previously, although the majority of those were for obvious reasons now digital or online, which brings me back to Bridget's point about the digital divide and ensuring that we force our society to help close this gap because you know, it's not going to be free, free to all. It's not going to be truly all unless we can close that gap. Yeah. Maybe, could, you, could you comment a little bit about this on a national uh, basis? This is so amazing, right? The 30 to 40 percent gap in digital access is, is, is so important because what that does is it marginalizes 30 to 40 percent of our workforce. It marginalizes 30, 40 percent of our kids. How can we be America, if if thirty to forty percent, we 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 can't engage thirty to forty percent of our people, especially if um, if engagement, um, you know, is um, really a, one of the key tenets of democracy, right? So 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 we know um, that uh, this is a run don't walk issue. And, you know, at the American Library Association, you know, which worked so hard in the nineties, right? Uh, with you know many partners um, to uh, to fight for ubiquitous um, internet access, to fight for low e rates, um, to um, fight for affordability um, when it comes to the internet. You know that same American Library Association now in 2021 um, during the period you know of pandemic where three of our most essential quality of life edu uh, uh, indicators access to uh, education, access to employment, and access to public health have all um, been largely, um, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, the access has been moved to digital platforms. Right. So in that same period, the, um, the American Library Association's council um, has um, declared that access to broadband must be a human right, and we must begin to fight for a free fee internet. Um, and so I think that right now what we're seeing, and I think there was a Deutsche Bank study that um, uh, in September of last year that said that specifically within the Black and Latino communities in the United States, um, especially the workforce, because a lot of, of, um, a lot of workers um, in uh, those communities um, are not in jobs where um, they are trained um, and, and have that kind of a digital access, that if we don't course correct, that by 2045, um, we could be headed for an unemployment abyss. And I'm using those are the exact words from that study. It was so alarming to me um, that I actually contacted the um, lead economist, Abdul Walia, to talk about that. And, and one of the things that I think is important for us to see is um, the parallel to that, um, Mark, is that what we know is that by May of last year in, uh, during the pandemic, um, Black unemployment alone um, was the quickest to reach double digits by 13% unemployment. So I think to, to David's point and to um, Bridget's point, digital equity, digital access, um, I don't think that there is any other institution beyond uh, the library um, that can really take on this issue and, 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 and resolve it. I don't know if my colleagues will go with me on this point, but there's a lot of national debate right now around redefining what infrastructure traditionally has meant. Yes. And why don't we just take that one small step forward and see libraries as part of our civic infrastructure? Absolutely. To, to borrow a phrase from, from Eric Lindenberg. I'm with you. Let's, let, let, let's talk about that. I was, I was just gonna raise, David, thank you so much about raising the infrastructure question. So let's, let's really grapple with this. So infrastructure has basically been defined as as things like traditionally things like roads, right? Airports, travel, transportation, so on and so forth. I think the real question comes down to what is infrastructure? And then you define the thing 
that fits into that category. I think that the question about infrastructure is really an, what it is, what a road is, but also what internet is, it allows the economy to function, right? So the question is, if we didn't have, have the internet, can the economy function? And so by placing the internet out of reach of 30 to 40% of our people, we're saying that the economy cannot function for 30 to 40% of Americans. That, that would make it infrastructure, doesn't it, Bridget? Absolutely. I mean, I, I can't imagine a world right now that, that would function at all without the internet because so much has been, especially in the last year, has been placed on there. I mean, think about the, the most recent census. The census was conducted online. So it's not just the economic infrastructure, which is critical, but it's our civic, you know, it's our civic institutions. It's our very basic kind of government functions are now online. And for, for many years, because there were, sometimes other ways around it, you know, just having the public library with public access to computers was enough to squeak by, but it's so clear that that's not right now, right? You know, the, the kind of stopgap measure where we leave the Wi-Fi on so people can sit outside our buildings at night, you know, I, I think that that is wearing really thin for families um, who don't want to have to bring their kids down to sit outside a closed library in order to do their homework. Um, so it is critical. And it's not just that families either can't afford or don't want to, or, you know, don't know how. Those are definitely issues that we have to address. But some of it, as you say, is actually infrastructure. There are parts of our city, we're in Hartford, Connecticut, and New England, with a very, you know, overall wealthy state. And there are places in our city that don't have fiber runs. They don't have the, the actual pipelines that enable companies to offer internet service. And that right now, this day and age, should not be. Are we talking about the equivalent of building ro roads in rural areas or rural electrification? Are we talking the modern day equivalent of binding the nation together, right? Through, through um, in the pre-industrial uh, age, it was through canals, right? Um, is that really what we're talking about, Tracy, in that, in that if we're going to be one country, uh, there needs to be that communication ability in order just to allow the economy to function and compete in this modern international globalized world? Mark, absolutely. Um, and I cannot stress enough what Bridget just said. I think, frankly, what we are talking about when we talk about um, information and digital access, we are talking about one of the key civil rights issues of our time. Uh, it, is, it is that important. When we think about who's being left out, and especially knowing that who's being left out is something that is very racialized and also classed, right? Um, and also, too, when we talk about geographic isolation as well, when we talk about rural communities as well. The American Library Association has been doing a lot of work in tribal communities, um, at which as uh, 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 Bridget has said, where the, the digital infrastructure, uh, the investment just hasn't been there. Um, we also have been doing some work in rural communities like Kentucky. Um, and one of the areas where we were really focused on supporting both the library and also to um, individual household hotspot access, um, actually giving libraries grants to disseminate um, hotspots to households in one community in Kentucky, 100% um, of um, school access was online, but only 7.8%, less than 8% of the households had um, household internet access. So what we're talking about here, I think, is um, actually what we do in, uh, in this moment and over these next three to five years is going to determine, um, I think, the course that education and employment um, are going to take in the next um, 20 to 40 years. And just as the United Nations also said that um, that we need to be uh, working for um, ubiquitous access to, to the internet by 2030, um, with a few years um, uh, to go, we know that we are going to have to radically course correct, but also to center the notion of digital access as fundamental to what we mean by infrastructure. It has to be considered as foundational as transportation. Yeah, and can I just, I just one follow-up point to that is, I mean, this is 
essential for education, essential for employment, but it's also for economic development to David's point that how important that is going forward, because the catch 22 here in this, you know, in our community and, and I'm sure others is that if the infrastructure isn't there, then what small business or even large businesses want to go there, right? And then, but the, the telecom companies say, well, there's not, there's not enough demand for us to put in the infrastructure because it's super, super expensive. So there's no solution. This has been going back and forth for a couple decades now. It's like, well, so, so you really are hampering that uh, ability to change communities, to actually have investment in areas where businesses want to invest but they just can't because they couldn't do business in that area if there is no connectivity. So it's, mm -hmm. it's critical for all of us to make sure. So it's not just that community that benefits, it's the entire city, it's the entire region. The problem Mark, is let me just, uh, one of the things I just wanted to say, David, very quickly, is that I think we are making inroads. Um, the, I think the library community and the American Library Association were able to make the case in the American Rescue Plan Act um, that was uh, just um, signed uh, by uh, President Biden um, a few uh, months ago now, feels like a few weeks ago. So I think that I think actually our country is beginning to understand that not only um, is digital access important, but that libraries as the main provider of digital access to the public are a critical component um, of that infrastructure. Sorry about that, David. No, I, I just wanted to add that the promise of the information revolution was on ensuring a more equitable platform and equal access for everybody. And whether you think that's a human good or a public good, um, or you want to base it on, you know, improving free market access for all, uh, the same principle is true that you, you cannot participate if you don't have access. And while we need to solve this as society wide, um, libraries traditionally have been closing this gap by being the point of connection, the point of device access, and the point of skills enablement. So all three are really required to help close this, this gap. And so uh, Mark, you were defining infrastructure as whatever it is that we need to participate in the economy or in accessing services. So Life, liberty, and the pursuit really of no, happiness, you... right? I mean, that's what that's what infrastructure is in America. Life, it, it's what is required for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Now, it's not everything, right? It's not. But there are things that are recognizable as being required, David, and that's that's your point, right? Yeah, exactly. That that um, that that this is about equal access and the type of society we've wanted to build. And then people have the basic skills, and then then they can pursue their dreams uh, and their uh, support their families and uh, better themselves the way they choose as individuals. But there's a baseline that you have to start from, and that's really what I think um, we're looking for in seeing this broader definition of infrastructure really better understood, uh, but also the role of libraries in making, in making that a reality. One of our attendees just wrote a it. note. I'm just going to read it. It's so cri uh, critical. And the branch manager of a very rural library, and there are huge gaps in internet access. And this is, this is something, by the way, we see throughout the country as we travel around. Um, uh, we, we got a grant uh, to, uh, to lend hotspots, but the program failed because the cell phone service is so spotty, right? So the, this attempt, heroic attempts by local disconnected, uh, under-resourced uh, libraries, schools, municipalities, um, there really needs to be a, a national response. If we're going to have 30% of our, of our folks come online and be able to participate in the economy, um, you, you kind of have to do this as a national initiative. The other thing that I thought was really interesting, Tracy, about some of your points is that it's, there's an intersection here between um, what uh, Isabel Wilkerson uh, wrote in, in this brilliant book, Cast, go to your public library, see if you can check it out. Um, and, and the whole idea of, of um, transgenerational uh, injustice uh, based in race, ability, disability, and, and other uh, isms, right? Sexism and, and, uh, and discrimination against members of the LGBTQ plus uh, community. Um, this, this intersectionality is really important because um, caste, 
wealth, often defined by wealth, um, within different categories also determines access. So if you're going to actually address the, these issues, you have to get to a point where fundamentals transcend. So anybody, regardless of wealth, can use a road, right, to get to their work. So if the road is the internet to get to your work, you need access to it. If the road to get to knowledge is the internet, it, that, that just sort of, it, it, it makes the argument right there, doesn't it? So um, let, let's talk about the future here because we've been, we've been obsessing a little bit about uh, the internet and infrastructure and digital and so on and so forth. Uh, Bridget, could you talk about the various other services that you provide uh, to your community members uh, in Hartford? And then let's go around the table. Uh, David, uh, maybe you can weigh in about uh, what's going on in Boston and uh, Tracy, if you see gaps in what we cover um, uh, from, from a national perspective, uh, uh, please contribute. But Bridget, what other services do you provide other than uh, access to books um, and access to the internet? Uh, uh, talk about what Hartford Public Library uh, does for Hartford citizens. Well, thank you. Um, so we do you know, continue to offer all of those traditional library services that um, people have come to know and love in our, in our local communities. But I think one, one of the things that makes um, Hartford unique is that we do have a significant immigrant and refugee population. So uh, for the last 20 years, we have had a service um, that we call Fondly the American Place. Um, and that is designed to assist people as they are seeking their path to citizenship. Um, so it's, it's those people that are eligible to pursue naturalization and we help them through the process. We actually get funding from USCIS to hire attorneys, immigration attorneys to counsel people. Um, we were the first library in the country to be accredited by the Bureau of Immigration Affairs to, to offer this service. And now there is at least two other ones in the country that do it as well. Um, so I think that's a really unique service. And now that umbrella of the American place has come to also include our adult education services. So what we've seen over the last few years is again, this kind of last mile, first mile uh, concept is that you know, introducing people to options that, that will help them move forward wherever they wanna go. So for many people, you know, while they're pursuing their GED with us or with another institution, they also wanna learn a skill or, or get a certification. So for example, in, in uh, Connecticut, you need something called ServeSafe in order to, to be a restaurant worker. It's an entry level job, but it, you know, it gets people into a workplace to get that work experience. So we offer those for free. We offer guard car training for you know, very low cost or free for folks. So that part of our training piece has become really essential. A lot of English language learning, um, and one of our more unique ones that we've done over the last few years through support from the Institute of Museum and Library Services is a um, program for late arrival teens or, or students that come to the United States um, with very low uh, English language skills and they come in right in the middle of high school. So the, the, the non-complete rate for those students was incredibly high in our school district. So we wanted to, to um, make sure that we could help those students be successful in their English language learning. So we partnered with the Hartford Public Schools to do that and also offer them a way to connect with their community and connect with each other. And I'm so proud to say that every time that we've offered this, we've had at least one of those students um, complete their studies as one of the top three students in their schools. So it's been an, an incredible success um, and we're really proud of that. The only other thing I'd like to mention is like kind of a shout out as unique service at Hartford is our Hartford History Center. Because as you know, um, Mark, we are such a, an old institution. We have records that date back to the 1600s um, in our archives. And we see a lot of researchers that come here and we have an incredible collection and we just launched our digital library lab. And I wanna thank David and his crew for helping us by uh, let, giving us access to your amazing digitization lab, which we have modeled ours after. So shout out to you. <laughs> you know, we just completed uh, uh, a number of polls. Um, uh, it's, it's interesting, 86% uh, of respondents uh, emphasized both uh, internet access and programming that you're talking about, uh, Bridget. And then 25% uh, uh, of the individuals responding to our second poll 
said that we need more, more of both, right? So, um, so the emphasis that you've all placed on this seems to be tracked by our attendees. Uh, David, um, uh, please comment on, on your programs. Then we're gonna wind up with Tracy. We're coming to the end of our time, uh, but what's going on in Boston? Well, I, I think um, Bridget's done a really great job of articulating the range of services that you probably will find versions of at most rural and public, uh, public libraries in rural and urban and suburban settings throughout the country. I would just add that as we come out of, uh, hopefully out of this COVID era, um, what we're expecting to do and find is a new appreciation of simply being in physical space with each other, because that is one thing that the library offers for free, um, unlike most other institutions in society. And so it may be limited at first and it may be a staggered return to normality, uh, but I think the ability to be in these physical civic spaces is so important. Uh, and then that gives you the opportunity to interact with, with programs and services and other opportunities that the digital is great and it's necessary, but it doesn't cover every aspect of our lives. And so uh, we look forward to, to really returning to more in-person service in the weeks and months ahead. We're, all, we're social animals, aren't we, Tracy? Absolutely. And I just want to back up what uh, David has said there. I think that we have... Um, spoken about on this program that libraries have evolved um, to meet the needs of our communities. But I think we've also established that the future evolution of our nation also depends on our ability to support libraries. So I just wanna say that, and I think that it is definitely a hybrid approach. It is the physicality, the face-to-face -face offerings, as well as the digital offerings that libraries provide or um, help our communities navigate. But to, to make sure that we are supporting the notion of libraries and digital access as um, foundational infrastructure, I just want to, in closing, invite um, everyone who is listening to get active, the call to action is that we work on the Build American, America's Libraries Act, um, which would bring $5 billion in support to libraries. You can go to the American Library Association, ALA.org website to find more about it. Um, and I wanna close on that note. And thank you so much, Mark, for the opportunity to have this conversation. Well, thanks. Thank you, Tracy. You know, libraries are the extension of our schools. They're extensions of our cultural life. They're the extensions of our workforce life and our constant education required in this knowledge economy. They're an extension of our social life. You are my superheroes. Thank you so much for your work in, in uh, ensuring that we have a more level uh, playing field to create the America of the future. Um, thank you, attendees, for sharing. Thank you, those who have shared uh, questions. They, they're always a big help. On Tuesday, we're going to continue this discussion with a, um, with a talk on uh, education for Latino youth and the college track. Um, and this is all part and parcel of this whole idea of engaging America in our future. Um, and hopefully, uh, everybody will, will be able to attend and uh, stay safe. Wear your masks. <laughs>